Thank you, Cornelia. Um, hello, everybody. Um, just before we get started, I'm using a different kind of sharing mechanism that Julian told me about. Can folks see my slides before we get started? Yes. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Right. Uh, please interrupt if anything goes wrong technically um, straight away, and I can try and fix it. So, yeah, I'm going to be talking about open source software, um, inclusivity for humans and companies. Um, there's, there is kind of a lot of focus put on individuals, but also the, there's value to companies, and that really reflects uh, some of the work that I'm that I'm doing right now. So, who am I? Why should you even listen to me? <laughs> what do I know about open source software? So, um, I'm privileged to be leading um, multiple teams actually at Netlify, but one of those is the OSS maintainers team. This is a, a team that that the C-suite decided to um, create to support open source, some of which will come back towards the very end of the presentation, not a huge amount about Netlify, but about benefits to companies in general. And they really want to effectively put their money where their mouth is, which is uh, fantastic and not something that, that all companies that talk a good talk actually do. Um, prior well, a couple of jobs ago, I, I worked for GitHub, um, which is self-titled the home of all developers, um, but also very, very heavily involved there, obviously, with open source, because much open source is hosted there. And, and sadly, we are, we were, as employees, um, having to care about users on our platform who were open source maintainers uh, or, or just open source contributors and various... Um, issues they might face. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to briefly cover some of that as well. Um, I have contributed to a bunch of open source projects over the years. Often I was using a project for a, for a job uh, when I was actually still writing more code than talking to humans. Um, I flip that around these days. I talk to more humans. Um, but yeah, I mean, I started out, I mean, Connie bit aged me slightly at the start there, but yeah, we've known each other a long time. But I, I started out when magazines full of code or a thing and you type stuff in and I remember submitting code by printing it out and sending it off and things so I've definitely been in, involved for a long time. So this talk I want to explore a little bit about what inclusivity means. I, I think we need to broaden that. Um, I think the industry in America is already thinking about things in a slightly broader way than perhaps the wider computer science industry. So I want to share that with folks. There are then some suggestions about how we could be more inclusive. And as I said earlier, I'm going to look at things from a business point of view as well as, as from the individual point of view. I am not going to set out a recipe for you can do all of this. Uh, I'm not going to set out to talk about OSS governance. I would need half a day for both of those things each. Um, this is really just to give you a bunch of information for a starting point, if you like. And if you're interested, follow up with me afterwards um, or, you know, go do some research on your own. Hopefully this will be a great jumping off point for you. So first and foremost, inclusivity. Well, we need to kind of define that before we, we go much further. I just want to call out that a content warning here. Uh, there will be mentions of certain things at a high level. I'm not going into details, partly because I'm not going to share personal information from folks. But if this is going to cause you any concern or any cause you any triggers, then please step away uh, for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, I'd love you to listen, but I also would love you to look after yourself first and foremost. This might be a brave side to put in something that's co-organized by BCS women, but I think it's important to remember that inclusivity is not just about gender. Um, it is. The only thing you need to think about, um, and as an engineering leader, it, it's you have to be very careful with a lot of the things that you say and do. Um, language, <laughs> for example, uh, which I'll come on to later, has changed and, and we need to adapt with that. So, yes, we need to have uh, non-male identifying folk involved in, in things that we do. 
but there's also um, sexual orientation that puts people on a minority. Ethnicity, depending on where the project is or what, or, or the um, company or whatever, can put people at a at a minority. Race, disability, religion, age, which is going to be our final talk, uh, and even economic status. All of these things are factors in how much privilege somebody might have that they might not realise they have, um, how much their normal is not somebody else's normal. Um, it can be hard to think about this sometimes. We don't like to be challenged. Uh, we don't We don't want to feel discomfort. We don't want to be told we have a step up that we didn't realise we had. But I think it is important to try and be aware of these things and provide mitigations or allyship or sponsorship or whatever is, is most appropriate. I think a key point that is often missed um, by folks maybe slightly a step away from open source is that it is a privilege to be able to work on it. You have to have the time, the energy, the family support if you have a family, the money to buy the equipment to contribute, the money to be on the internet to contribute. Um, so, you know, these are these are things that that is often not thought about, you know, when, when the, the log4j vulnerability that I'm sure all of you in the industry's heard about um, happened last year. It was like, well, why isn't somebody fixing it? Well, who should fix it? There are no permanent maintainers of that package. These people have day jobs. Uh, they have other priorities in life. There's all sorts of things like that that we have, I think we've forgotten about. Um, the very early origins of open source were all about free, as in every sense of free. Now there are many, many open source licenses and a lot of things used commercially are not LGPL, um, especially V3 for a lot of reasons, but you know, loads of other stuff is used commercially. So how that is maintained is, is an important thing. Um, and by making open source in general more inclusive, then we can start to break down some of these barriers. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to first kind of start out with some of the things that we could do to make it more inclusive for individual people. And this is probably at a project level um, here. Uh, and my, my key message, if you like, uh, the one thing that I, that I want you to take away beyond the other starting points is that I think you need to be intentional about inclusivity. You need to think about it in advance you need to have a way to respond if somebody is harassed in your project um, you need to deal with characters that are, are abusive potentially I mean maybe this never happens to you maybe you're lucky maybe your project is full of folks that are being collaborative and there's never any falling out but human beings tend to have bad days and, and maybe say things they didn't really mean to say out loud sometimes even the best person with the best will in the world will, will have a bad day these are things you should think about before they happen so that you can handle those situations speak to folks involved or message them um, also think about sustainability now it could be that you put something out in the open because you want to share but if you have no intention of maintaining it make that very clear in the readme archive the repo um, that that is a big signal on github for example that that something is not being maintained. Again, combined with the readme information, doesn't stop anybody taking that code and building on it. Doesn't stop them taking that code and just using it as is. But, you know, think about if you're gonna grow it bigger. I, I know maintainers of bigger things, um, for example, Homebrew, they have, a, you know, a committee that, that helps them drive the project. So it's not just falling on one person. Think about these things. Um, also, there's uh, a good few things that you should be aware of. Um, Burnout is one. Um, I, I want to call out that this isn't just overwork, although that is a common problem in open source. It can be from a lot of repeated microaggressions, for example. There's, there's a lot of literature on burnout being wider than that. Don't put too much pressure. Again, this is very much like being a, a manager in an engineering team. Don't have too much pressure on, on any one individual. Um, because at some point they like to crash and burn on you. Um, there are biases um, that people have. 
they, they don't like developers that use a certain language or that want a certain, I'm going to say it, you know, tabs versus spaces, if there's not, not a linting rule in the repo. Some of these we may joke about, but but there can be biases that are more problematic than that. Um, there's also very much stereotyping, uh, something that Elizabeth mentioned, you know, in, in what we call uh, women or, or females as children. Um, that really can continue um, in adulthood. Um, that can be around gender or, or gender identity, but it can also be around, as I say, the languages somebody uses or which country they're based in so they're no good or they're better if they're from this company, uh, country. Sorry. Um, gatekeeping is another one. I had to do it the hard way. Why can't you? Um, that is one of the big problems around having folks new to your project come contribute. They're, they're intimidated. They don't, you know, they don't know how to get started. And if you have the wrong first interaction, you're going to walk away. Um, you know, that that's something that, that's important to consider. Um, microaggressions, you know, as I said, everybody has bad days and maybe says the odd thing they shouldn't. But but if they're constant or, or a bunch of people are saying the same microaggression to somebody, that sticks, that builds up. And that will also kind of cause them to go away. You take that a step further and you've actually got forms of bullying and harassment. Um, and, and that even has extended, for example, um, I'm definitely not naming names here, to employees of GitHub in the past. Um, campaigns have been waged against them that, that legal and security of the company had to get involved with because somebody didn't like something they did or GitHub did. Um, that is obviously on a larger scale. But, but all of these things are things that you really do need to think about, even if you don't think they will happen to you or your project. So how, how can you be intentional? Uh, again, I need a huge workshop to cover all of the things. Um, but I think these are some easy ones to start with. So, so it's be welcoming. Invite people um, to participate. And once you have, make them feel welcome. Make them feel like they belong. If you don't make it feel like people belong, you can be as inclusive as you like, people will turn up and then walk away. They need to feel it is okay to be there. Um, having means of a, both open and safe communication is important. How does somebody report harassment? <laughs> that is where you need to think ahead. Um, having a code of conduct in a, rep uh, in a GitHub repo or, or a conference, for example, they're, they're really important. Um, how will you act in the moment when something happens. If, if you haven't thought about it and you haven't planned for it, it could be too reactionary one way or the other. If you thought about it when it's not happening, you can have a better plan. Um, the other side is to make sure you do enforce it. If somebody um, steps over the bounds of the code of conduct that you've asked them to agree to by being involved in the project, you need to take action because again, otherwise people won't believe that it gives them any protection and, and will walk away. Um, a key thing here as well is language matters. Um, in all of the reasons that I suggested that we can be non-inclusive, um, there are you know, ways of using language that, that are not appreciated. Um, a very, very common one outside of the US and in some parts of the US, but more outside of it, is to call, uh, to treat guys gender neutral. This is not a net gender neutral term. Um, and even when it's meant in a in a in a friendly way, in a hey, we're all guys together, that does not always land well with some people. Adapt your own language, um, <coughs> folks. Your people, friends, lots of things you could think about using. Very simple one. Um, there are you know similar ones around ableisms. Um, some something's not crazy hard. It's just really difficult. Um, it, it really does require you to to think beyond your normal language patterns and to be inclusive around the world in different cultures and different languages and to educate folks. But but the payoff can be really high um, for quite tiny changes. Beyond that, which is all about kind of getting people involved and staying, um, then then it's I think it's important that you share clear expectations. Um, not so much for your one-off PR, hey, I fixed this bug, but if people are coming to you and they're, they're, they're wanting to be solidly involved in the project, 
look out for them. Um, set boundaries, say, you know, what are you committing? What are you able to commit? Um, and if, you know, they can give you two hours a week or they can give you eight hours a month, but they can't tell you when or whatever, you know, you can work with that. You can plan for that. Um, and you can say, okay, well, I'll make sure to kind of protect that time. But you can't have to be a, a manager, a project manager um, some of the time. Um, but if you help them to help you, they will. They will take some of the load off. Um, I think another important benefit of open source is mentoring and sponsoring. Um, mentoring, obviously, is guiding someone, upskilling them, giving them experiences they may not have had already. Sponsoring is actually saying, hey, <laughs> I have this other opportunity. I think you'd be great for it from all the work that I've seen you do on this thing. Let me put you forward for that. Um, all of these things, building strong networks and, and helping people get a foot in the door at a different company or a different project. Again, all really great ways to, to get involvement and trust and, and all sorts. Um, I think also it's important to evaluate and revise um, any project and any community around that project it's going to be partly organic it's open source you don't hire people they just come along um is it are things heading where you would like them to um sometimes that might not be the case you might want to take corrective action or or prioritize some other piece of work or some other piece of functionality it's like any project <laughs> it's it's rarely too late for you to make those changes you may lose a maintainer here or there or you may upset a few of the community, but if you are open and transparent and explain why you're doing it, overall you will come out okay. Um, and you will also potentially, as I say, shed, shed some people, but maybe those people are no longer interested in the new direction. And that's okay, that's healthy, but it stops them kind of hanging around and causing problems. So you might also um, ask quite fairly, why do businesses care about this? We've talked about people and, things you might do in, in open source projects. Um, but there's there's a bunch of reasons. Um, realistically now, every piece of commercial software is like to have some open source somewhere, apart from possibly, you know, really custom hardware level written code. Um, it isn't just Linux um, anymore. It's not just about infrastructure. Um, most products or services in almost any programming language have third-party open source dependencies. Um, <coughs> it makes sense to, to have code that's already been battle-tested in production. Um, but then you don't have the same comeback either as code that's in-house. It, it, it's a balancing act. Um, it's been proven from data that the businesses generally perform better um, when their contributors are diverse, be that perspectives, skills, whatever. Um, you get better and faster technical innovation um, and above average profitability, which let's face it, businesses care about. <laughs> um, the, the technical innovation also you know, applies to open source projects in their own right, whether they're used by a business or not. Having different viewpoints and being able to argue out in a positive way the best solution given the constraints can can lead to some really good outcomes again uh finance businesses another reason is reduced cost you don't have to pay licensing costs if, it, if it's open source um ideally if this code is written using open standards then it's easy to have interop interoperability with your existing code services even co other commercial pro products um but it's also a route to hiring. People might contribute to things and you're like, hey, I see they're doing really great code and we could really give them a career that I see they're interested in from what they're contributing at, at this company. You don't have to make them whiteboard horrible puzzles. They get to, uh, they get to demonstrate that they've, they've already got this code. Um, so so that, that you know, is a, another side aspect to think about. Um, and then sort of finally, it's important for businesses to be able to customize code. As I say, it's not their own code, but they can fork it and customize it um, and then maintain it in-house if that's appropriate um, and the licensing allows. Um, but it, it also, you know, you don't need to keep rewriting the same small bits of 
functionality. Somebody's done it once. It's been optimized. It's been running in production in so many systems. Leverage that. Um, so those are those are sort of some of the reasons businesses might care. But kind of underlying all of this is that people are key. People in your open source projects, um, people at your company using the open source projects, um, and then anybody that kind of builds a community around that. Um, help people to help themselves and they 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 may well end up helping you directly or indirectly. You never know when somebody might reach out or have an idea or it, it can work. Um, all of the intentional advice around open source projects that I've given is um, definitely applicable to companies when interacting with open source. As a company, you should be a good open source citizen as well as encouraging your employees to do that. Um, and even helping um, guide maintainers. You know, you may have more project management resource than, than an open source project. If you can donate an hour of that time instead of an hour of code time, that might help them organize their issues and things like that. So be part of that community. Um, and yeah, I'm just about on time, I think. Um, and the final slide was uh, any questions. Um, so I know we're leaving these to the end. I'll speak to you at the end. Thank you for listening, folks.